They showed me falling because I had a really good fall. They showed me falling like four times throughout that episode. Some of the behind the scenes stories is what makes makes the experience for the viewer better. So on the Vegas finals course, bleeding out of my nose, posturing, I got taken off in an ambulance. All these kids are like, oh my God, look at the rhino. They're freaking out. They're loving it. And I'm like, no, I want it to be like a kid's book. I, I wanna I just wanna help educate people. And that's that's really what it comes down to. Like they're just these slow moving kind of slimy creatures, but they can jump. I was amazed the first time I saw that. Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Welcome back to another episode of Wildlife Outdoors. Today, we're thrilled to welcome a very exciting guest, Anthony Porter. You may know him as a fierce competitor on American Ninja Warrior, but Anthony is much more than an elite athlete. He's an outdoor enthusiast, a mentor, and now a children's book author. His journey from the ninja course to the great outdoors is filled with stories of adventure, education, and a deep connection to nature. We'll dive into all of that and more, including his latest project, which is sure to inspire the next generation. So welcome, Anthony. How you doing? Wow. Can I keep you like in my pocket to just introduce me to people? <laughs> man, that I'll was good. I worked a little uh, bit on that one. <laughs> yeah, no, it was fantastic, man. Jeez. Um, no, I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. I uh, I so rarely get to be on on outdoor podcasts where, where people that are genuinely into the outdoors get to ask me questions. I love it. I love it. Yeah, let's let's do it. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we're happy to have you and we love your energy. Um, I did a little bit of a dive on your YouTube channel and, and your social media. And uh, it seems like every video you have just so much energy. So I feel like we will definitely benefit from that on this episode. So we appreciate you hopping on with us. Heck yeah. Thanks, guys. Hopefully you didn't dive too deep in the YouTube. I don't think, you know, like sometimes when things go viral and you forget to like make the the far away things from the past deleted oh gosh i think i have some like i love my girlfriend posts still on those main pages i, I don't believe i found any of those sweet okay cool, cool, cool but yeah no uh so i do see that you do like a lot of you know survival stuff and and um you add some comedy into that so is, is that something that you've always enjoyed just the comedic side of stuff yeah man i think just growing up it was just like a standard. I thought that everybody just liked making fun videos on like their camcorder with their brothers. And like, mm -hmm. I don't know, it just seemed, it was like so fluid growing up. And um, I kind of found this niche to where it's not about survival and it's not about comedy, but if I can get somebody to laugh and learn something, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But like at the very end of the day, even if they didn't think it was funny and they hated the video, they still learned something. Yeah. So, yeah. It's kind of like a nice little fail safe to be comedic and educational. And uh, honestly, my whole passion, my entire like purpose is just to educate people to get outside more. You can't conserve what you don't understand. So just getting yeah. next, the next people out there that are scared of the world to, to not be scared. And have you always had this passion for the outdoors or is that something is that something I guess I was instilled in you early on or something that you kind of grew into to appreciate? Yeah. I don't know, Jose. I think it was like the, it was like a standard that was younger. Like my family, I think did a really great job of being like, here are some options for you. You know how to backpack, you know how to camp with a tent, where are you going to go with it? Me and my brothers all got the exact same like upbringing of being out in nature. They're both computer pro programmers that don't <laughs> leave their houses a lot of the times. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll scratch that. They go hiking and surf and stuff sometimes, but I, I'm outside all the time. So it was just this weird twist of fate that, had me gravitate towards that. And I think it's just, you know, nature lets you wander, like, and wander, like, just straight up, like, I want to be off the map. And yeah. yeah, I think Skyrim really helped playing Skyrim a lot. <laughs> I was like, oh, crap, I could probably do this in my real life, too. So I, I do. Dude, that nice. is one thing about me is I love in nature. I love going and just going places. But you put me on a game system on an open map. And I have no clue what I'm doing. Any free range open maps, I am, and I'm not a gamer, but I am the worst at them, I swear. I think the first open map game I ever played was like Borderlands or something. And that still has nice. missions to complete. And I still couldn't even do it. It's just, <laughs> that is not for me. <laughs> I can't figure it out. Dude, they're fun. I think, I mean, 
I don't know if I could ever go back to a non-open world game now. Like the idea of like, all right, it's dark outside now. I hiked and wandered all that I can. I'm going to go inside and hike and wander all that I can <laughs> online. Like, I don't know. It's cool. That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm the complete opposite. I'm more of a I need you to tell me where I need to go or, or else I'm not going to figure it out. Like I remember whenever um, The Last of Us first came out and it's like this real dark map and I didn't have the settings right on my TV or something because it was extremely dark and I could not figure it out. I played the game probably 3 times and said, "Nope. I'm I gave it to one of my buddies. I said, I can't even play this." <laughs> I'm horrible at it. Yeah, those dark games. Oof. Yeah, yeah, they're they're uh, very difficult for me. I, I'm just, I don't have that kind of mind. <laughs> so at what point did all of your outdoor backpacking stuff start to translate into like fitness and, and where did it take you to how you ended up on American Ninja Warrior? Like, I don't even know how that transition would take place. Yeah, man. Good question. I don't even know. I mean, I think we're all super impressionable when we're in our teens and mm -hmm. I watched Planet of the Apes. Um, and then right after that, I went to Home Depot. I was like 15 or 16. I just had my permit and I just went to Home Depot and just bought a bunch of really thick rope and just uh -huh. hung them from my tree. And I was like, man, it'd be so cool to swing like they could. And I just practiced that. And then like cut to like three years later, I got like really good at just like upper body parkour esque rock climbing stuff. And my family's like, dude, you know, there's a TV show that does all this stuff, right? Like you, you know, that you would be perfect for this. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. It's probably too easy. I don't know. Really, I, I was, I was like a, being a little chump about it. And, um, then I'm like, all right, fine. I'll apply for it. And then I got accepted for the next, for the next like five years on the show. And I've just been going nonstop, but it really was, um, I think the segue was the passion for wanting to be a capable person. Yeah. I think if you're like a really avid outdoorsman, you're understanding that you have to be capable. Like, if you know, if you, if you got a fish, you also got to know how to tie knots, how to do lashings, how to get a hook out of your finger when you mess up or somebody's being stupid next to you. Like, so you got to be good at first aid. It's just like the more you're out in nature, the more well-rounded you have to kind of be in that situation. And, uh, um, being capable is, yeah, took me on a TV show. Just rad. That is awesome. So the first time that you got on the show, is there, so we only see what obviously is televised. So is there yeah. any type of like training with the show or is it all just you and then you go compete and that's it yeah man super good question um when i was really young i auditioned for like the voice in american uh -huh. idol and for those it's really intense you, there's mm -hmm. like five different auditions before you get to the first audition on the show yeah there's like a whole there's a screening process they have to check your backstory all the stuff yeah for ninja warrior you just like make a youtube video send in like a 10 page application and they're like, all right, come to set this day. And you're going to, you're not going to be able to touch any of the obstacles. Just send it, try your best. And then if you do well after that, then they're like, all right, interesting. This Anthony character, now that he did well, like what's his backstory? So they do it the opposite. They, I see. they, they see how you do first and then they do all this other stuff. So that was kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no training. That's insane. Yeah, because I have a couple friends that have gone to do the voice in American Idol and stuff like that. Growing up in Central Texas, kind of close to Austin, you know, you, yeah. you have people to do that. And I have seen some amazing vocalists haven't even made it to the first round because their backstory isn't what, you know, the producers are looking for on the show and stuff like that. So um, yeah. to hear that this is the opposite of that is actually kind of a good thing, in my opinion. So but as the athlete, I couldn't even imagine like you don't know what you're going to be doing and you just have to be ready to go. You make one mistake and that's it. <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really, I mean, it's make or break. I mean, you could have, you could be the best ninja in the whole like world. And you still like, sometimes you misplace your left foot. If you do that once you're, you're done for the whole season. And like some of these guys, they have gyms, they have uh, sponsorships and they have all these things that are based around the fact that they have to do good at this super sometimes sketchy obstacle course on TV. Yeah. And like, that's, that terrifies me to know that like some people hold their entire career right. and livelihood <laughs> and their family, they support their family based off of how they do in this two minutes across the entire year. It, it blows my mind, but yeah, that is, they gotta be good. They they're fighting for something. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. I, uh, I've done a somewhat kind of warped wall. I don't know if the dimensions were comparable or not, but that thing is 
difficult. And then having to yep. do that after an entire obstacle course, like I couldn't even imagine. I'm I'm nowhere close to even trying anything to do with parkour. So, I mean, that's just coming <laughs> from me. But I was at like some trampoline park with my kids one time and and they had, you know, a kids work wall and a regular one. And and I was just like, yeah, this is I, I did it, but it took everything in me to do it. And that wasn't after doing a full obstacle course. So <laughs> that's off to you for that. <laughs> yes. Thanks, so, le- so leading up to like, your first competition. I imagine you watched to some degree anyway, uh, American Ninja Warrior. Was there an obstacle that you were like really nervous or kind of dreading? And were there other ones that you were like really pumped? Like, Oh man, I'm going to crush this. That's a really good question. Um, I don't think so. Honestly, I get, I get in trouble for this a little bit because I'm out in the woods so much. I spend very little time watching TV. And when I do, I'm like, Oh, I want to play Xbox. Like, I don't know why I would not want to choose my, my media. I can, instead of just playing. So, um, uh, I've gotten turned away from a lot of projects because I don't watch them before I apply mm. and I didn't watch Ninja Warrior before I applied. I think really? I saw like wipe, wipe out a few times and I'm like, yeah. oh, it's probably <laughs> the same thing. It's not the same thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, I think that one thing that, uh, really took to me was the salmon ladder. Um, if you folks are listening and you don't know what that is, that's the one where you have a bar and you have to hop the bar up a bunch of rungs on each side to get to the top. Um, that was something that I saw on the green arrow TV show arrow. They did that a lot. Um, and I'm like, Oh, that's like the pinnacle of fitness. And then you go in to like the training gyms before you like, um, there's just a lot of like Ninja warrior training gyms around the country. That's like, the easiest thing. <laughs> That's really? Like the, the, yeah. If you, if you can do like a good solid pull up, odds are you can do a salmon ladder. Um, I see. if you just get your knees into it, which is like the, the ethic for it. So, yeah. um, yeah, I just really want to get into that. So I promised myself the first year, if I, if I hit the buzzer the first year that I'm set, I'm happy. I won't do it again. I, I checked that off my list. I fell on the second obstacle the first year. <laughs> <laughs> terribly <laughs> slammed straight on my back back flopped oh. it was awful my pants and my underwear flew off in the water and i was naked underwater because <laughs> i fell oh, i fell yeah. hitting the water first and i was kind of like a taco so that uh. it slid off my legs <laughs> and so i was like underwater like putting on my pants again <laughs> oh god um they didn't show that obviously but they showed <laughs> me they showed me falling because I had a really good fall. They showed me falling like four times throughout that episode. <laughs> I remember watching that. I was in a bar in Minnesota and I was like, oh God, this is like, I work so hard and that's, that's it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I remember the first time I got accepted, it was like, I was so nervous. Like every time I thought about it, I'm like, oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. Like I'm so nervous <laughs> now. Like after a while, you just get so used to it and you're like, oh, yeah, I got accepted again. All right, time to time to do it. But once you get to that stage, it always comes right back. Like that's so there's always they, they film it a lot outside or on site. Those I'm not alone wow. because th- those pit toilets and those and those <laughs> porta potties are just full. Like everyone's so nervous and they're all just like, <laughs> This is my the, the cool part is like you don't have to like sit down and be still. Like you're moving, you're jittery. So like your yeah. scary jitters are getting pushed out into the course, which is which is rad, but yeah, that's way more of an answer than I think you wanted. <laughs> no, I'm happy with it. <laughs> uh, some of the behind the scenes stories is what makes makes the experience for the viewer better. <laughs> so, um, with so you said that you had to apply for the first time, and then if you do good, they call you back. So if you failed on the second obstacle, did they call you back for the second time you went on, or did you have to oh, reapply? Yeah. Rad. Uh, I reapply every year. Even the okay. best of the best has to reapply. Every oh, really? Year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So usually your rookie season, you do pretty, pre- pretty badly. That's like mm-hmm. across the board. Um, some people are getting obviously way better now. Uh, just, it's just like the learning curve. Cause some people that are competing now are older or are younger than the TV show is. Cause we're going into after this season, it'll be season 17. Really? And, um, I didn't even realize it's been yeah. going on that long. You got 15 year old kids going in there and they're, they're just ringers, man. They'll go in there and like, they bounce back. Two years ago, I got a concussion while on the Vegas finals course, bleeding out of my nose, posturing. I got taken off in an ambulance. I woke really? up uh, a day later on my birthday to a guy being like, 
don't touch your head. It's really swollen. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was nuts, but I just, you don't, you don't bounce back as much as these 15 year olds do. And yeah. uh, there, a lot of these kids are homeschooled their entire life. It's just traveling around the U S going to ninja gyms, doing competitions. That's crazy. You just, as a, as it's weird to say as a 28 year old, I'm like too old now, <laughs> you know, it's weird. I, I feel that. So I'm 31 and I still play football. I am no longer playing full contact football as of last year. Um, <laughs> but I still play flag football and I'm debating nice. on going back next uh, next year to go back and play full contact. But I feel that because there's some of these D1 athletes coming out there, 19, 20 years old. And it's like the first time that I actually feel old. Like I can't compete. I can't keep up with them. I hurt after a game. I hurt oh. after a practice. Oh, it's, yeah. it is. Uh, we're definitely getting to that age where it's going to start feeling that way. <laughs> and you know, the fact that they're like, these kids are training so, so much harder now than we were. Oh, like, for sure. Like, I, I just, I can't wait for their knees to hurt. Oh, I can't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. Time so, marches on. I, that it does. <laughs> yes, it, it does. does. <laughs> so, I, you started off in the outdoors. You went to American Ninja Warrior. Where in that, like, did that open up any doors for where your career stands now? Yeah, I think it opened the biggest door of all, and it only opened this one door. And it was... I, I could be somebody. I think that was, that was like the, the mental door that it opened. So, um, as soon as the second year came around and I went from one of the worst performances of Ninja Warrior ever to top 17, I think in the country or maybe 16. Um, and just in the span of, I think two years, cause COVID knocked one of the years around weird. Um, I was like, you know what, this could be, I've got it. Like I've got something. And um, that gave me the motivation to really get into branding myself better. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, I just got, I honestly got separately viral doing educational nature content. Ninja warrior didn't really help me out at all with that. I see. Um, I, re I remember like the exact days of how like fixated I was on like follower numbers and stuff. And, uh, obviously it's ridiculous and silly, but like back then, the people that really were into Ninja Warrior that followed me from all that stuff, I maybe had like 1,500 followers from it. Um, really? Which, hey, that's super cool. Some of those guys still follow and message me, and I love it. Um, but yeah, and then I just did one video about like uh, faking my death in front of a woman because I'm scared of them because that's also what dragonflies do. And then the next day, <laughs> I had like over 10,000 followers, and it just went up to crazy numbers. Oh, wow. And then it just like snowballed, and I just kept making different content. And I think this week without honestly trying too hard, I've gotten like over a million views on, on just stuff just from things being around, which is cool. It's incredible. I'm so grateful for it. But um, yeah, Ninja Warrior allowed me to understand that I could be bigger and better. And I could use my platform to like, yeah, help the planet. Like that's all where it comes back to. Absolutely. See, and that's what we're big proponents of. Like, I'm a big believer personally that if we have clean soil, clean air, and clean water, we're going to be much better off. And there's yeah. a lot of people out there that unfortunately just don't know that, and they'll just leave their trash here. And, you know, I'm, I'm the type of person where if I go somewhere and I'm empty-handed, if there's trash there, I'm not leaving empty-handed. Like, I'm going to leave the place better than I left, than I showed up to it as. Yeah, and totally. um, I, I think that's something that a lot of people can do, but a lot of people just aren't told to do that, you know? Exactly. And I think, I mean, up in here in Lake Tahoe, uh, where I live, it's a big challenge because it's a, it's a finite amount of space in this bowl of a lake. Um, and there's just more and more people every year recreating. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, like people like you, Russell, that pick up trash and stuff. It's, it's incredible. It's truly amazing. The people that leave it there, sometimes it's malice. Sometimes it's drunkenness. Like that's, mm -hmm. I'll accept that. But also it's like, the dad that has four kids and his wife is telling him, we, we got to go home because we have like other things to do. And he's like, all right, I gotta, gotta bring this, gotta bring this. And like, little, do you know, he left an entire cooler full of trash at the beach because he was just frazzled by all the stuff. So yeah, it's hard because like nature doesn't care if you have empathy or not, like it still has an effect on things. Yeah. Um, but understanding where people are at and being like, all right, if I could make personally a bunch of videos to be like, Hey, 
this is nature. You're familiar with it, right? You're, this is your, this is your place. And like, this is your home too. Um, I think I can bridge that gap of like people that can't be bothered because they honestly have better things to do. Like a lot of the poachers that are just across the planet, they're mm-hmm. not doing it because they, I don't know. Some of them do it because they, they love money and stuff, but other people do it because they have to feed family members and they're going to yeah. die otherwise. Um, so yeah, figuring out where these, where these boundaries are, are super amorphous, but, um, my, my role in this whole thing is positivity and education. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to Steve Irwin the crap out of this world and see what happens. <laughs> so it's funny you say that because when I first started watching your content, whenever you reached out, I, I was just like, this guy kind of reminds me of like a Steve Irwin or like a, uh, Jeff Corwin type of guy. Like mm-hmm, yeah. you have all this knowledge, but yet you're entertaining. I just... That's funny that you say that. <laughs> or like the uh, what was that show? The Zabuma food. That's the uh, something brothers. What was oh, that? with the lemur. Yeah, 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 yeah. Zabuma food yeah. was awesome. <laughs> yeah, guys, yeah, I used to love the show. Yeah, I um, yeah, all those guys. I mean, we had we had such a cool upbringing of Animal we Planet did. and stuff like that. I mean, Animal Planet now is like a little bit more reality based, and it's not like as it's a little bit different. So yeah. Um, everyone's just trying to get views and I'm right there with them. But, um, <laughs> yeah, th- I think that was really the golden age of like animal education. Um, oh, for sure. And, Agreed. you know, I think David Attenborough paved even their way. Yeah. And if you saw what he started out doing, I mean, he was, I think like, yeah, in his late teens or early twenties, just like picking up animals from like Guyana or just like some random countries and then bringing them back to his studio and just like filming with them. And sometimes they were endangered. Sometimes he had no idea. He's like, look at this. <laughs> and then they would fly back and then just like put the animals back. And that's crazy. Um, like that wouldn't fly nowadays. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, for the time, like he inspired so many people through that work. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be, I want to be that for people. Dude, I didn't know that that's how he started. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I didn't neither. know he was doing stuff like that. Yeah, look up BioQuest. It was an old BBC TV show. Okay, um, sounds familiar. Um, yeah, is it was it BioQuest? I think that's what it was called. Um, yeah, and it's just him in like a suit and tie in like a studio, <laughs> being like, "This is a crocodile." <laughs> Dude, that's so cool. Yeah, I, yeah. I've uh, obviously seen some of his work and stuff, and a lot of his narration work, but I did not know that that's that's crazy to think. I mean, now you know, everybody would be in up in arms if, if somebody were to do that. You're yeah, absolutely exactly. right about that. But yeah, that is pretty crazy that he was just like, Oh, look what I found. Kind of like you with that snake yesterday. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. I'm going to post that video tomorrow, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, it was great. I mean, I was very, I was very curious about it cause I have the same issue. I'm like, Oh, people are going to call me out. But essentially I spent all day Saturday looking for a snake cause I wanted uh-huh. to film a video with a snake. And so I went on to iNaturalist, which is a good, like, citizen science website where if you're like, Hey, I see an animal, I'll log it here. Be like, Hey, yeah, animals are found here. It's honestly a little bit like a live Pokemon go. Like you could be like, Oh, <laughs> sick. Like that's where the salamanders hang out. All right, cool. Um, so I use that to be like, all right, well, I need to educate with an animal. Um, a rubber boa is like the least threatened, super docile, like super malleable animal. I, if I pick it up at a spot and then bring it back to the, the exact same spot, and it's unharmed, beautiful, especially like sometimes I don't eat for like six months at a time. If I take him for a night, like he's not going to starve. Like, so I felt good about that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I ended up finding an awesome snake on Saturday. I named him Splinky. Um, (laughs) and, uh, I cuddled up to him at night uh, in a little pizza box that I had next to my bed and I kept him like safe and warm. And, uh, then I filmed a bunch of kids videos and adult videos. Um, I'm saying adult videos just for yeah. adults. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes like, I gotta delineate that. Um, and then yeah, yesterday I brought him right back to the same spot and he just like looked around, saw the hole that he lived in, and then just went right into the hole. And I'm like, all right, well that was like the most harmless way to interact with an animal. I'm really happy I did that. So dude, that is awesome. I I used to go out and catch snakes all the time and and I've you know before I knew better, there was times where I'd catch them in my backyard and keep them for two years and you know feed them and and i didn't realize at the time that that would obviously make them more human dependent which isn't a good thing but i mean i've caught rat snakes and you know garter snakes and all sorts of stuff uh, at one right point on. i think i had a uh, prairie king snake for maybe six months or so 
And um, th- those snakes, they reek. <laughs> I guess one of their yeah, defense yeah. mechanisms is to defecate. They're, it's called their musking. Oh, That's what they're, it, it they is musk. horrible. It, it was bad. That was probably one of the worst things I've ever smelt that I picked up in terms of animals. <laughs> <laughs> God. But, so you said it was a rubber boa? Yeah, they're called rubber boas. Um, They grow up to about two and a half feet long. um, And they just look like really, really, really big worms. They're just like dumb, silly, rubbery, Mm. but they're gorgeous. (laughs) And they're, yeah, um, yeah, it was really cool. I I did some videos about to make sure like when you're hiking, if you see a stick on the road, don't, don't like run over it because it might not be a stick. Yeah. Um, It could be something else. So uh, I did a little video about that, but. Uh, I laid him down on the on the grass, and then he just goes, "All right," and he just like put his head perpendicular to the ground and just went straight in. I'm like, "Oops, sorry, buddy, this is not your home. I'm gonna pick you back up." Yeah, but they're incredible, incredible animals. I really admire snakes. I learned uh, a lot about snakes this weekend. <laughs> yeah, I've always been a snake fan. We actually had on a guy, uh, Michael Kirkland, out of South Florida, a couple months back, and he's the one that headed nice. the. Uh, he's working with the Burmese python invasive like. Uh, bounties down in south florida and he is a snake lover as well and so he said it's kind of weird because he's the one that is removing these animals um but yet he has this love for snakes and he said this the second that he becomes desensitized to it is this is the day that he's going to quit because he cares so much about them but yet he plays an important role in helping with the native ecology there um so that was a very interesting episode if you're into snakes you'll probably like it but he invited us to go down and help with the removal of some uh burmese pythons and i want to take him up on that go down there and catch these 20 foot snakes i feel like it would be awesome how cool that is so awesome um yeah totally i think that's that's a really special um snakes are really interesting because they're so alien to us Mm -hmm. and to have uh, a good relationship with them i think is so mentally healthy for the rest of like your interactions with nature, because if you could find something so absolutely alien from you, a limbless, cold blooded, scaly, like, like, I don't know, thing noodle, um, (laughs) and danger and like find kin. Yeah. And find like a kindred (laughs) love with it. I think what the heck's what's your obstacle after that from helping the planet out, you know? Absolutely. And maybe not even necessarily a love for it, but an appreciation. Cause there's, exactly. you know, at, at least like, uh, you know, growing up where I grew up, <clears throat> I always heard this thing, like the only good snake is a dead snake, which is, and I used to adhere to that mentality before I know now what I know, you know, and, um, mm-hmm. man, I kind of like you, like I've really, really grown to appreciate them for what they are and their place in the ecosystem. And even the venomous ones, like it's not their fault, you know, that they're, they have this potent thing for protection or for helping them, you know, be efficient hunters and things. It's not their fault that, you know, they're finding themselves closer and closer, or or I guess we are now sharing, you know, closer proximity to each other's like habitats and and things. So it's, it's, it's really, really hard. Like I don't like killing snakes. I never, I, it didn't bother me before, but now I, I, I hate it. And even when I like, you were going back to your point, when I see things on the road, I try to slow down because to your point, it, it may not be a stick and I don't want to kill something. I don't have to, you know, and, but there are still people who like, you know, they just, they just don't appreciate that or they just don't understand them and they don't bother to try and understand them. And, uh, yeah. and I get that there's certain situations where you may want to remove them. Like if there's kids around or you have, you know, there's certain situations where I, I, I feel like it's acceptable to some degree. Um, especially if you don't have the means for capturing it safely yourself. Cause you know, they can do quite a bit of damage and snake bites are not cheap to treat, but for yeah. the most part, you know, it's just, man, it's, yeah, I think just becoming more appreciative of the wildlife, especially since we're sharing the same planet and the things that we use, like, like we're going back to Russell's point of clean air, healthy soils, clean waters. Like it goes a long way. I think it was all the yeah. Leopold may have said, you know, it's, Nature is not something we should conquer, but something that we should like cherish, like a lover, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And, um, I woke up this morning eating some eggs and I pulled out my old biogeography book and I was just reading through some stuff. And I think, um, 
if you ever want like a fun perspective on like where humanity li- lies in like the 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 world of of the planet that's not us it's just the planet itself i mean crack open like a book about about evolution of animals or just like the 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 time scale because like it'll go through animals like nothing like oh yeah there used to be like a rat that was the size of a pig and then that died off but then there was a dinosaur and that dinosaur was amazing it was like the height of dinosaur civilization and uh, of course they died and then after that was these cockroaches that were like the size of, of like giant rats and they died and then there were humans and now we're great and like just to see like the fact that we don't understand that we're we're going to be such a fast blip by like the amount of mm-hmm. ecolo- like exponential progress that we have I, I mean we'll we'll be we will be gone and that's okay. We're a fleeting thing. We're, it's still beautiful to be a part of this whole experience. Um, but, uh, there's, there's no way in the world that we're going to like, just be the end. Like Pange- tectonic plates didn't stop moving. Like yeah. the entire world is still doing its whole process. And yeah. it's a, it's such a privilege to, to witness this planet mm-hmm. and, uh, who knows what's next, but sure as hell isn't going to be people like in the far future. So, right. um, yeah, somebody's going to dig up our bones and be like, wow, these people had Chipotle. How cool. <laughs> Ooh, Chipotle. Well, anyways, They're... after that, after the humans, there were these monkeys the size of, you know, so yeah, yeah. it's a fun little perspective. It is. I never looked at it that way. That's that's definitely a very interesting way. So you're obviously passionate about conservation and ecology and stuff like that. So at what point did you decide to take that into educating others? Mm, well put. I don't have much else I'm good at, honestly. I think education is <laughs> probably my only thing that I can do. Um, no, I don't know. I think to be to be to be like frank about it is like um, I didn't want to be around people after I realized how much we're kind of messing up the world. I'm like, why would I want to just fill into a system? And mm-hmm. like, it's just this self perpetuating downward spiral to me. And and I was like super obvious, like everyone goes through their own ecological like crisis of what to do in this world. Mm-hmm. Um, but as much as like the pe- like people can like hate humanity and just be like, oh, these people just use and just take and take. We have such incredible, incredible capabilities to change things around so fast. I mean, you look at like the conservation efforts that have happened around the globe. It took almost no time at all to give land back to animals, to give uh, population opportunities back to these species that were going to be on the brink of extinction. And yeah, we killed them in the first place, but we're the ones that cultured them and brought them back. And there's this healing power of humanity that we can so tap into way more. And uh, if I can inspire people to be that, people are like these blank slates. If I can tilt them in that direction a little bit more, I think I'm doing my job. And I, I think uh, I probably realized that sometime in college. I don't know. I, I was probably sitting in a tree talking to a buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, there's a, I don't remember where, I want to say it was somewhere in Europe where they had built these dams and these fish were were not able to breed due to the dams they were building. And I don't remember exactly what they did, but they had to make some type of way to where the fish could still move upstream and spawn, but also with the dam there. And it was the same thing that you're just talking about. I was like, that's crazy to think about that. We did something, you know, and I, if I'm not mistaken, it was a dam built uh, for power or something like that. So something that mm-hmm. humanity needed at that time that was causing issues with another animal. And then they were able to, you know, fix that. They're like, oh crap, we realized we made this mistake. This is what we're going to do to fix it. And now those fish are continuing to move upstream and be able to breed. So um, I think it's amazing that that there's things like that happening around the world. Yeah, It seems almost like we're being more, I guess, cognizant of our impact on the world now. Like um, in many urban areas, they have like these greenscapes, you know, on apartment buildings and other things like that, mm-hmm. where they have gardens and flowers and whatever for pollinators or um, like even community gardens for like, you know, shared agriculture and things like that. And then, you know, bridges and highways, they serve as barriers to wildlife, but now they're having like, I forget what the proper term is, but like these, I don't know, these, these wildlife bridges. Wildlife essentially. crossings. Yeah. 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 We're actually building one up here in Tahoe. Yeah, dude. It's awesome. Yeah. I think I can't remember. I think it was somewhere in Europe. 
Like there's a bridge purely for wildlife. Like it's just filled with like native grasses and things like that. They can just follow and it's going over like a highway. I mean, it's, it's nice that we're, I guess, you know, we're still fulfilling the needs of people because we're all constantly expanding. We're growing, but taking into consideration the needs of wildlife too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a hard battle because I think people that are desensitized to to conservation, to, they don't want to be a part of it or like, that's not their bag. And that like, I think that sh- climate change just keeps getting shouted at people and it's way more local than that. It's literally like, do you really need a giant fence in your backyard or do you want to share a space with your neighbors and have a, a larger area that animals can walk through without being sectioned off by square foot and, and let it more be, be more natural up here. Mm -hmm. There's a place called the Tahoe conservancy and their job is to literally just buy plots of land and strategic locations that would be built on otherwise that way animals can get through areas um, because animals need to get to this lake. Animals need to get to streams. And if it's up to humans, we're just going to have a bunch of fences everywhere. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. But I think, um, the next step for people to really understand that is like take climate change out of the equation. Like we're not going to get there if like community grassroots efforts are, are institutionalized as just being like, it's more about freeing up land for animals. If that happens, there's going to be less CO2 in the atmosphere. There's going to be more animals, um, just biodiversity in general. So I think that's like such a huge part is, is, uh, if it's desirable land, think about why it is and, (laughs) and see what we can do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So going from that, does that kind of lead into the book that you ended up writing is to teach the next yeah. generation these same things that we've been speaking on? Yeah, man. It's fun. I, I, um, I've been doing well being viral and, and, and getting out in the world and, and really showing people uh, fun little tips. But my next step was always to, to show kids really what mm-hmm. was going on. And um, I made kids curriculum and stuff uh, for other jobs that I've done. And it, it just kind of like it fell into my lap so s- perfectly. I was like riding a high of being on like some, some good channels and doing some good partnerships. And then so a publishing company reached out to me and they're like, listen, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I was like, well, obviously everyone thinks that they should be an author. I don't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, and they're like, all right, what would it be about? And they're like, do you want it to be a survival book? Should it be an autobiography? And I'm like, no, I want it to be like a kid's book. I want it like, that's first off my level of like writing skills, <laughs> but also, um, yeah, I mean, I, I want to, I just want to help educate people. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. Like an autobiography would be nothing except stroking my own ego. And no one wants mm-hmm. to listen to what I have to say about my own life. I'm like what the hell? So, um, <laughs> yeah, educating people is such a huge part of, of my life to where, that was like the first thing that I, I really like said yes to. Um, and it was a, a huge, huge time investment for me to get that done. Um, there's this one Denny's that closed down next to my house, but I would just walk to that Denny's every day with my laptop and just like make these like elaborate PowerPoints with strategic like messaging and like all these little blurbs and stuff. And that ended up becoming the book. Um, oh, wow. My Epic Nature Journal is what it's called. And, um, there's like a a couple of different pages where you can just freeform draw about the stuff that you saw that day outside. Um, and then the next page is going to be like crafts or it's going to be activities that you can do outside. And I don't know, some people, they don't have parents to teach them how to make a rope swing or Mm -hmm. how to make a fort in the backyard or, um, what the uses of a bird feeder are, how to make a bird feeder, like out of a milk carton, you know, just Mm -hmm. like super basic stuff that maybe you don't have access to, um, I just want to get people on the same level and not that my book is going to like change the world, but I'm, we're all trying to do something. So hey, you never know. You never know who you're going to influence. You, it may change the world. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's like such a gray world is like, not in terms of like tone, but like um, it's no black and white. Like I used to work at SeaWorld for like a month just to kind of see how things were going. Yeah. Um, and see if I could get a career in like marine ecology. And I loved marine ecology. It was so fun to learn all that stuff. And there's like some downsides of SeaWorld. We mm-hmm. all acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, and then I was like doing education pieces. And I can't tell you how many times somebody came up to me saying like, oh, like in the, in the dozens being like, I am a marine biologist now. 
thanks to SeaWorld. Thanks to you guys educating. And I'm like, oh my God, there's so much gray in this world. Like, obviously they're doing good, but Mm -hmm. they're also like, you can't synthesize what an ocean would feel like for a whale, like ever. No one could do that. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So it, yeah. Great. Dude, I, man, I had like that similar like revelation with zoos. You know, when I was a kid, I loved zoos. It was cool. It was like a great way to see animals I only saw on Discovery Channel or Animal Planet. You know, it was just the yeah. coolest thing to me, you know? And then I remember we took my nephews and nieces like as an adult. And I remember walking to the same zoo, but this time, like, I was like kind of sad. I was like, dang, dude, like, he's in like the rhino, this little tiny enclosure or enclosure. It's like, dude, this poor thing. But at the same time, I'm looking around and all these kids are like, oh my God, look at the rhino. And they're freaking out and they're loving it. It's so tough, I'm like, man, it's tough. It's tough, dude. And I remember I went home and I was kind of thinking about it. I was like, dude, it's as conflicted as I feel because, you know, I, you know, I like, I'd like to think I'm, I'm passionate about the outdoors and conservation things. Like I would not have gotten, I guess, that passion ignited if it weren't for, you know, zoos and SeaWorld and Jeff Corwin and, and, um, Steve Irwin and all those dudes, you know, and so I think they, these things do have their place. They open the world to these kids who are like very impressionable. They get to see these things that they'd have to travel to another country to see, you know, but they get to see it at home and with their families and share those moments and have those memories. And not only that, but a lot of these zoos do great things. Like there's one in Dallas, like they're responsible for reintroducing or they're helping to reintroduce, uh, not necessarily reintroduce, but assist in repopulating uh horned lizards in texas because their population have been decreasing oh, so nice. a lot of these zoos do great thing great work for conservation so it is kind of in, in and there are zoos that are some are better than others you know for sure i think we can acknowledge that that's kind of i guess existent in mm-hmm. you know everywhere you know, in everything in the, in the world you know but yeah i mean zoos are these things do like imp- like are they they do make impressions on people who can affect and they could affect them for the rest of their lives before better or worse yeah so yeah so there's there's like zoos and sanctuaries and like i think that it's, yeah. there's sometimes a weird line between the two of them but if if you can like support a sanctuary rather than a zoo it's usually way way better and yeah. a lot of zoos now have to obligatorily say we are doing like conservation efforts because I'm pretty sure there's like a legislation being like, if you own a bunch of animals for no reason, like you have to actually give back to the environment or it's a PR thing. But um, yeah, sanctuaries, look for that before you look up zoo next time you go to a city for anybody listening. And uh, that's, you're one step closer to being a steward. (laughs) (laughs) And I think zoos and sanctuaries can actually create more stewards, you know, speaking more on that is, you know, because there's been a lot of people that I've known that have built this love for animals at a young age because they're going to places like this. So Mm -hmm. um, not only are, are they helping out with, you know, conservation and stuff, if, if they actually are doing what they say they're doing, but there's also a lot more people. So I, I've I've always looked at zoos whenever I started getting into conservation, kind of the same way of, of, Oh, these poor animals are stuck in this little cage, you know, and there is something to that, but then I always try to remind myself, like, I wonder how many people are going out and putting good things out in conser- in the world of conservation because of what they're experiencing in zoos and this love mm-hmm. they're building for these animals that they can see up close and personal, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my, my youngest daughter, she is an animal lover through and through to the point where I am still currently trying to get her to stop picking up spiders and trying to kiss them. <laughs> she can't tell if they're poisonous. And every time she does it, she, she'll walk into my room with a spider in her hand. I'm like, stop. And she's like, but, but it's, it's fluffy. I want to kiss it. And I'm like, you don't know if it's poisonous. She's like, this one's not poisonous. I'm like, you're not wrong, but you can't tell if they are or not. You're six. Um, But she's the same way. I mean, she wants to just help every animal that, that she finds. My oldest daughter, on the other hand, wants to kill every spider that is in the house or any type of insect. And she'll scream and run and throw something at it. And my youngest (laughs) is like, let's carry it outside. So, um, She's definitely an animal lover. She gets that from me. <laughs> right on. So tell us more a little bit about this book. So you said it's like a, uh, it can, it can tell you how to make crafts and, and you can journal in it. So what is the format of it? Is it kind of like a storybook yeah. or? Yeah. Good question. Um, it's, it's 
very indicative of my brain. There's no story. There's no linear path. It's just like <laughs> a little bit of chaos. There's a little bit of organization. So it goes like reflection pages, like um, the reflection pages will say something like, oh, today's wacky question of the day is, would you rather ride a dragon or be able to fly? I and see. then you're like, oh, crap. And so like kids have like a question like that to kind of open up their minds. And then um, there's a there's a picture to draw, like anything natural that you saw that day. And then underneath is the five senses. Like today I smelled, today I heard, today I tasted, today I felt. Um, and then like there are some pages that are like hardcore checkpoint reflection pages to be like, Russell, if your daughter's like, oh man, I wish I could go outside stuff. And on the page, it says, if I could go outside tomorrow and play with somebody, it would be this person and then blank. And then, so it's kind of like also a, a book for the parents, you know, five yeah. years down the road when their kid's off at school and they're, you're sad sitting at home and you're like reading their like little chicken scratch and they're like, oh, they <laughs> wanted to go outside with me. Oh my God. Um <laughs> So there's like those kind of pages. There's these little prompts, but also they have these crafting times where um, every, uh, every like seventh page is a craft of some kind, or there's like physical challenges. One of them was called leap and lemurs. And it's how, what kind of animal are you based off of how far you can jump? So just like put a line on the ground and see how far you can jump. If you're uh -huh. like one foot, one foot, I think was like a cricket. Two feet was a salamander. Three feet was, I, I can't remember, the, but I was really impressed with how far a salamander could jump. Cause I, I, was, I yeah, was too. Yeah. No, salamanders could jump, uh, like a couple feet from what I remember. Yeah. I was, I was amazed. So, um, I was out on the Cossatot river here in Arkansas, kind of close to the Oklahoma border. And I caught, I believe it was a Washita salamander, but it was a tiny little salamander. And that thing jumped from hand to hand. Oh, kind of caught me off guard. I was not <laughs> expecting. I had like, they're just these slow moving kind of slimy creatures, but they can jump. I was amazed the first time I saw that. Yeah, dude, they're nuts. I'm Googling it right now. And it says they can jump six to 10 times their own body length into the air, wow. which is similar to a human jumping 25 feet from the height of two to three millimeters. Yeah. That is insane. Good. Yeah. Anyways, yes. fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> fun fact of the day <laughs> <laughs> well it sounds like a uh amazing book so for those of y'all listening out there make sure you go check it out what was the title of it again anthony oh it's my epic nature journal awesome and where can people find it oh man you can get it anywhere you can get it at amazon you can get it on the barnes and noble website um there's some like back store uh, like family homeschooling sites that have it too if you want to homeschool your kiddos it's a good way to get them educated um, yeah, honestly, I would say 90% of the people are just going to go to Amazon. So yeah, go to Amazon, right. pick it awesome. up on Amazon. And yeah. I will put the Amazon link in the description as well. Uh, so right you've been on American Ninja Warrior, you've worked in public education, you've written a book. What's next for you? Oh man. Um, I'm in a shopping agreement right now with some, um, producers to kind of start getting some TV ideas pitched. Uh, awesome. There is a bit of a vacuum when it comes to animal education um, that is just for kids. Mm -hmm. um, and I know like Brave Wilderness, if you guys have seen that guy, he does some cool stuff. But I don't think getting like bitten by the world's most dangerous hornet <laughs> is part of like the kids <laughs> curriculum. Right. <laughs> um, so I don't know, finding something of that nature. Uh, but uh, I'll be honest, the, the, the reality unscripted TV world right now is like they don't even know what's happening. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's like very survival reality, like bing, bang, boom, flashy, um, yeah. scripted. I think a lot of the networks are kind of in panic mode right now because everybody expanded so fast during COVID mm -hmm. with all these shows because everyone's getting subscriptions. Now we've created this like critical mass of all these different subscriptions. And then they're all going to start to combine again together, monopolize, and then they're going to expand again. It's just like this ever flowing thing. So, um, I don't know what it looks like in the future, but we're just talking with producers and stuff and being like, Hey, nature education is something that is super viable. And whether it's a PBS show or a Netflix special, I want to make sure that people understand, uh, how they can get outside in, in like a safe, but like super adventurous way. Right. Right. Nice. So I know that you love being outside, but you're also an archer, right? Thanks. So how long yeah, have you been archery, into man. archery for? Oh God. How old am I now? Uh, I've been doing it for about 
16 years. Jeez. Oh, wow. Jeez. I've never said that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I should be way better. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your uh, favorite kind of archery? It looks like you do a lot of traditional archery. Yeah, I'm mainly a traditional archer. Um, I do have my compound named Beast. Um, I got it because I did some um, some archery consulting for a certain YouTube channel. Um, I'm not going to say the name, but you can guess maybe by the name of my bow. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I don't know, man. I don't know if I like compound. Uh, I, I it's it's cool, and I. I respect that it's a more ethical shot, but the fluidity and the energy exchange and, and like the, the, the simplicity of just like a, a regular traditional bow, it just, it just literally touches my heart more. Like it just, it gets it. Um, maybe not literally touches my heart, but, uh, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah. But I have a bow right now. Uh, this guy, Tony Seminuk made him. Uh, it's called a white wolf archery bow. And they're these high performance four limbed bows. So they're penobscot bows. So they basically, they have three strings on them. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, it adds like an extra, like 15 pounds to the bow. Oh, so wow. I'm shooting, I think I'm shooting like 57 right now. Um, I don't think I want to get higher than that because like if I'm over hiking or long, long distance backpacking and I have a bow, like I need to make sure I can confidently pull it back every time. Um, yeah. if I'm like malnourished or whatever, I think 57 for me is like a pretty good height. I could probably get to 60, but I'm not trying to impress anybody. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And then I've got like a few travel bows that are some takedown bows that I can, um, I like bring to Ninja Warrior in a suitcase so I can, I can travel with it easier. And then, yeah, my compound kind of collects dust right now. I'm not going to lie. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. There's something about traditional archery to me that is just appealing. And granted, I've only ever shot them like it, you know, when Arkansas Game and Fish will have an event or something and, and they have a traditional bow there, whether it be a longbow or recurve or something like that. That's the only time I've ever really shot them. I'm not experienced in them, but mm -hmm. there's just something you just feel a little more connected with it. You know, there, there's less hardware. It's just a little more natural. Um, and it's very appealing to me. And maybe it's just because I'm Native American as well. Maybe that's a little bit in the bloodline, but uh, traditional archery just really stands out to me. But that's something I've wanted to get a lot more into. Um, but unfortunately, I have a compound bow that I shoot more than anything else. It's, that's the way it goes. I, I will say, um, I'll, I'll do some trivia for you guys. How long do you think humans in general have had archery in their cultures? What's like the, the furthest back do you think it's gone? How many years? Well, do you mean like modern humans or like how long has archery like, uh, been around in the in the in the humanoid sense? I'm gonna say like thirty thousand, maybe that far. You think sixty four thousand? Wow, I was way off. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, to your point, Russell, it it could be in your blood. You know, I mean, <laughs> the use of such a mechanical, simple tool to be used constantly over 64,000 years, that dare I insane. say, that's enough to get into the genetics, genetics, but, yeah. um, who knows? Who knows? That is insane. I, I did hmm. not know that it was, it's been around that long. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's nuts. That's insane. That's pretty cool though. <laughs> Have you ever made your own bow? Um, <sighs> Have I? <laughs> <laughs> um, nothing of consequence. When I was younger, I did, but nothing of mm -hmm. um, nothing of. Y you know what? I'm a, I'm a I'm a user. I'm not a creator as much. I create yeah. I create other stuff. I created a lot of like uh, swords, shields. Um, I was really into wood, but I haven't gotten into like heat treating wood and stuff like that. Do you guys have Have you made your own bows? I have not, but that's a goal of mine. <laughs> Yeah. Right There's a company in um, Portland. It's called Trackers Earth. And their job is literally just taking kids outside and doing the most like simplistic outdoor bushcraft skills with them. And I had a friend that worked there and it was pretty rad. Um, and they also, they give them bamboo lengths and they have them cut their own notches and make their own bows. Um, really? Dude, of, that's like fake awesome. sinew and use the boat. Like, yeah, yeah, it's super cool. So, like, shout out to Trackers Earth, but um, there's somebody that 
I really want to see more pop up around the country because that's definitely a Pacific Northwest thing. They've got enough yeah. uh, suburban uh, extra money to have that happen. <laughs> so kind of in that same vein, um, I know there's a few yeah. folks who listen who are probably parents or or may become parents in the future. What are some, I guess, like uh, some like good entry level things that – you know, a family could do to introduce their kids to the outdoors. Nothing crazy. Don't start crazy. I think a lot of people are like, all right, my kid's nine. It's our first big, big camping trip. And we're only going to use a hatchet. And like, do you think that kid is going to come away from like this really intense camping trip being like, oh, yep, I'm an extreme survivalist now. Like <laughs> it's, it's those steps. I would say <laughs> take him to a park like just like the most bare minimum, let them lay on the grass and just look up. Like it's more important for them to be mindful about what, where they're at than what they're doing. Um, if they, if they want to play their Game Boy SP in the grass, like, wow, did I just really date myself? Sorry, my bad. Um, <laughs> if they want to play, geez, where did that come from? <laughs> hey, Game um, Boys were top notch back then. Yeah, wow. Yeah. That was so fluid out of my mouth. I just jumped back forward like <laughs> 10 years. Not even that. What was that? Like 20 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I got my Game Boy SP when I was eight. Now that I remember it. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, having like having the ability to be capable outdoors. If your kids don't have the physical capabilities to go outdoors um, and they can have the physical capable to be outdoors. I, I, I met somebody who was a nutritionist that uh, was talking about like, if you're a parent and unf and like your kid doesn't have any like pre-existing mental like health conditions or mental conditions and they're like really really obese and they want to stay inside like that's almost imprisonment for the child because they don't have that access to go outside as much um you're imprisoning them in their own body um so letting kids just learning their own way to be capable i mean i found archery when i was like 12 which really got me outside i would make my own arrows and and try my best to not Hurt, shoot myself but <laughs> what is that for your kid finding that out um but don't don't start <laughs> don't start extreme and maybe buy your kid a game boy sp you don't want to go on a 15 mile backpacking trip with a six-year-old trying to get him going <laughs> i just i actually just um got a call from a lady today at um there's the tahoe rim trail that's up here that goes around the entire lake it's like 170 miles She's oh, like, wow. oh yeah, at the age of three, my son hiked about 170 of those miles with me and now he's five and we just finished off the last five miles. So Jeez, uh, we finally insane. completed complete the trail. I'm like, geez. I mean, there's some people that are outliers, but yeah. I, I wouldn't be a stoked five-year-old if I was made <laughs> to do that many <laughs> yeah. miles. My goodness. I felt like I was uh, taking my daughter on a little too long of a hike one time. We went and we were going to do a four-mile hike. And it was getting pretty, I think it was triple digits. And I was like, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and cut this in half and, and hike straight back down where we started and figured I'd cut it in half. Well, we ended up taking a trail that I thought was a trail. I didn't have a map. <laughs> thought the trail was the trail that we were taking. And we ended up doing about seven and a half miles. And um, I felt horrible because she was sweating. I mean, we had water and everything. She was fine, <laughs> but uh, she was tired. She's like, I don't want to hike anymore, daddy. It was like a hundred and something degrees outside. I felt horrible, yeah. but a hundred and nah. something miles my goodness you're good i think if she knows your heart was in it and obviously yeah. she's still into nature so yeah, yeah you did good yeah. no did we, good. we've been hiking since i don't think i killed it for her but <laughs> <laughs> good i killed it for my family for sure <laughs> they're too much it's too much uh, i i've taken her up uh, we have a in little rock there's a place called pinnacle mountain and um, there's the East Summit and the West Summit. And one of them is, so if I'm not mistaken, I think the West Summit is the harder one, more challenging, like not paved at all. And the East Summit is a little bit longer, but it's a lot easier. And um, I took her up the easier one. And it's, I don't even know the elevation difference, but you can overlook like all, you can see all of Little Rock from the top of Pinnacle Mountain. You can see the Arkansas River. You can see into like the neighboring towns and stuff. Like it's just this one peak that it's absolutely gorgeous up there. And uh, she loved that too. So, um, and then I take her another place here in hot springs called goat rock and it's only like 1.2 miles, but you get some awesome overlooks of the Washita mountains. So, um, yeah, she's, and we've done both of those since I've taken her on that seven and a half mile trip. So I, I think she's fine. <laughs> Heck yeah. Yeah. I mean, to, to your point, Jose, like 
<clears throat> when I first started doing adventures with my family, like there was a little up in Big Bear Lakes in California, there's um an old mining shaft that goes down into the ground, maybe like 10 feet, but it just goes across. Maybe it's it's like, it's not that intense, but the first time we ever went up it, it was like an insane or to like drive up to the spot. It was, it's all clay exposed rock. And our car was slipping and sliding. It was a thunderstorm. It was raining. And I remember listening to sticks in the car with my dad. And it was like in my brain after that, I'm like, Sticks is like the crazy adventure band that we listen to when we do crazy <laughs> adventures. And like, I remember more about the trips up there listening to Sticks than I do about the actual adventures, but just associating those positive experiences with going outside. Um, it could be something that unrelated to nature, I guess is my point. If you yeah. get them outside be like, Oh, we're going to play football at the top of this mountain. If they love football, like that's yeah. rad. Um, yeah. And then they can later deconstruct those associations to be like, Oh, I actually do just like nature. <laughs> yeah. That is a good point. Doing something mm -hmm. that they already enjoy outdoors. will definitely. Yeah. I never even thought about yeah. doing that because normally I want her to focus on the outdoors, but that's something nah. I might have to incorporate is just take her to, you know, if she wants to bring something along that she enjoys doing, that's not outdoorsy. I'm going to let her take it next time. I think that's a good point. Cause when I think about, oh, let's go do something outdoors, immediately I'm thinking of like going hiking or camping or fishing, whatever. I don't, I don't think of just being present in the outdoors with the person I'm taking while they get to do something they enjoy. I think it's just being the, the physical presence of being there with like the birds singing, the sunlight, you know, yeah. all that stuff. I never really consider that being just as like having as much an impact, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, I remember this soccer game where I played when I was like super young and this girl that was on my team, I was like eight or something. She told me that she was allergic to grass. So she's like, don't push me down. I'm like, what? Why are you playing soccer? <laughs> and I remember she fell. She just, at soccer. She fell down at some point and she was screaming and crying and her skin was fine. She was totally fine. But I'll, either she was a hypochondriac or her family was a hypochondriac and like just the ex like they just weren't at parks often and they just figured like something was up with her and um yeah it's just like that that bigger the distance that we have it doesn't have to be survival camping skills it could do the, yeah soccer or exactly what you said jose also yeah, i looked great. this up while we were talking um uh arrowheads have been found dating approximately seventy two thousand to sixty thousand years ago so I do oh, have a fact. Wow. Uh, that is insane. That's yeah. crazy. And the history of archery on Wikipedia says approximately 70,000 years ago, probably developed in Africa by later Middle Stone Age. That hmm. is crazy. Yeah. Huh. That's pretty awesome. Well, maybe it is uh, becoming interwoven into genetics by now. <laughs> Dude, I hope so. I want it. I want it so bad. Right. That's so cool. So if someone were to want to get started in archery, in traditional archery, mm -hmm. where would you recommend they start? Oh boy. If you didn't serve that up on a silver platter, um, I made a series of videos being really? like, Hey, you want to shoot some arrows? Come, come hang out with this guy. And we're going to learn. Um, <laughs> and I basically, I make like a 15 minute video all about what equipment to buy Anthony's per personal preferences, um, where I went to get my stuff, how much money you need to spend. And then the second video is like how to actually shoot the arrows. The third video is more about like specifically shooting outside in nature. Um, so yeah, uh, check out my channel, Outdoor Anthony on YouTube. That's all one word. Um, that's a great way to do it. But honestly, anybody on YouTube, there are so many good basics on how to get it on YouTube. Don't, if people are selling you things on YouTube channels and you want to start archery, don't watch those videos because they are getting paid to give a product that they might not even know about. So, yeah. um, there are a lot of good salt of the earth, like archers on YouTube that are just trying to educate. Like I am, um, Cody Haynes is a really good one. Um, mm -hmm. He's a really good traditional archer. I learned a lot from him. Um, or is it Colton Haynes? Cody Haynes? Something Haynes. Um, incredible, incredible archer. One of like the best traditional archers in this. Don't look at Lars Anderson. That's that's all I'll say. He's cool, but he does like trick shooting. If you want like applicable shooting, don't 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 go to that guy. He's like the most famous archer on YouTube right now. I respect his game. I respect it. But it's just not like applicable shooting. I see. That makes a lot of sense. 
So you said where we can find you on YouTube. Where can where else can we find you on? What other socials? Yeah, man. Outdoor Anthony on everything. Um, okay. Uh, TikTok, uh, Outdoor Anthony, or you can just look up Anthony Porter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Instagram as well, Outdoor Anthony. I go live and actually do archery lessons every Sunday on my TikToks. Oh, awesome. um, so every Sunday at around 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, I'll just hop on my lives and be shooting arrows and throwing axes and talking to people until TikTok eventually bans me for restricted content or something. <laughs> yesterday I was yesterday I was filming and it said that I got a complaint on my filming. I was like, oh, why? I had like a few hundred people watching me and they said, uh, your use of tobacco. I'm like, I... Like, there's nothing. There's no, what are you talking about? Like the AI ag- algorithm of TikTok is like really peculiar, but um, I might've just said some word that sounded like tobacco. It was very interesting. But um, hmm. anyways, until I get taken down on TikTok, I'm teaching everybody how to shoot arrows. Um, and then, yeah, on on uh, Instagram, you can find me. Honestly, send me a message. I'm happy to chat anytime. My, my website, anthonyporter.com, just do a little keep in touch at the very bottom and just send me a message and I'm happy to chat. I'll answer any questions you guys have. Awesome. Very approachable. Well, <laughs> I will leave all those links in the description as well for those of y'all that are watching. Jose, I'm curious behind you, is that a fly fishing setup or is that an archery setup? Uh, fly fishing. I do. So Russ and I, we both fly fish. Oh, yeah. um, I really like fly tying. I haven't done it in a while. And um, I recently moved for some work and there's just this like little room in this house I'm renting out. So I decided to turn it into my fly tying area slash like podcasting room. And then eventually uh, I do like to shoot bows too. I have a compound. I want to start building my own arrows. So going to slowly, nice. like I guess inch my way into that. So just trying to do a little bit more research on like equipment and things I'll need for that. And then um, eventually like I, I, I built a fly rod like a year or so ago, I gave Russell some, my, my stuff to, for him to get started. And I guess whenever I get that back, nice. I'm going to try and, you know, start building my, some more rods out of here. I got a couple in the, in mind that I'd like to, like to build out, but yeah, man, it's going to be my little, I guess, kind of creative room for lack of a better term. Dude, everyone needs one. I love it. That's so awesome. Yeah. Hopefully I'll get started on a uh, building my rod soon and I'll give you your stuff back. <laughs> <laughs> Do you fly fish at all, Anthony? Um, yeah, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't gotten around to it. Um, really? Uh, I wish. I I want to get into bow fishing, but there's not a lot of opportunity around here mm. to get into it. Um, I know there's some to do that specifically just for invasive hunting. So mm, uh, I think there's it's called carp carpocalypse, where you just get mm. the uh, the carps out of uh, certain lakes down in Southern California, and I think mm-hmm. that just happened last month. I missed it, but um, anywho, yeah. I want to get into it. There's too many things to do, too little time. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> yep, absolutely. Well, once again, we really appreciate you, appreciate you hopping on. And for those of y'all that are watching, thank y'all for making it to the end. And we'll catch y'all next time. Thank you, guys. This has been Wildlife Outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.